thank you very much for coming to listen to me. I will take the next 15 minutes to talk to you about something that is close to your skin, close to my skin, close to the future of our generation and generations to come, close to our children's future and the future of their children as well. This is a transformation that we are starting to experience today, so we're on the cusp of this change. Some of it is present already in our everyday life, and some of it is yet to come. It is a profound transformation. It's the first time humanity is moving towards the systems of both economic governance and economic production, which are human-centric rather than machine-centric. Let me walk with you through this journey very briefly. So, what the hell is human about human capital to begin with? Well, we started defining human capital, we as an economist and the society, by very tangible definitions, which are hardly human, really, in their nature. First of all, we looked at the education, or attainment, and formal education and skills. Both of those are embedded in terms of the years and the jobs, years and education, types of education achieved. In addition to it, we later added things like work experience. That's how long we stayed in a particular position. And that somehow was reflective of our human capital, our ability, our potential as well. Later, we added less tangible things, such as aptitude to work, attitude to work, things like that. Over the recent years, we started shifting towards more individualized, more human dimension of human capital. We started measuring and started trying to reflect in our assessment of human capital things like creativity, things like innovative capacity of workers and individuals, things like risk attitudes, attitudes towards risk, attitudes towards entrepreneurship, abilities to manage risk, abilities to manage different forms of entrepreneurship, blend entrepreneurship with everyday work, and so forth. Things are becoming very complex here and very much not measurable, something very individualized, something very human. Finally, in more recent years, we started adding things like social and emotional skills, ability to form networks, social networks, ability to have empathy towards other human beings, ability to hear what they are saying, but also ability to lead networks and ability to carry them with us across different geographies. This is a very interesting type of things, but all of those things, if you kind of deep, dig, uh, dig deep into yourselves, you will find out that you actually not only have them already, but you're also living through those changes as well, those definitional changes. I'll give you a couple of my personal examples of that journey as well. When in 1990 I moved from Moscow to Los Angeles, I was the Soviet expert par excellence. I had in my possession certain technical skills, which were above the average. I had in my possession certain attainment of education. Not quite a hell of a lot of it at the time, but still it was distinguishable enough and it was technical enough and narrow enough. It was a classic expert type of education. It was education in highly technical skill, physical sciences, theoretical fields as well. Over the years, myself evolved, but also I saw the world around me evolve as well. We are now living in a global pattern of flows of skills and human capital. And those flows are no longer defined just by narrow definitions of skills. They are defined instead by talents. They are defined instead by the entrepreneurial abilities and attitude towards entrepreneurship. They are defined instead by ability to innovate and even an interest to pursue innovation as such. What next, you might ask, on this journey of human capital? Well, next we're going to witness the change of geographic distribution of human capital. Up until now, the traditional form of human capital flow worldwide was from the so-called South, in other words, from the emerging economies, middle-income economies, lower-income economies, towards the so-called North, the advanced economies. And then there was mobility of human capital within North, from one advanced economy to another. What we are witnessing today is the increasingly the breakdown of this pattern and its reversal. First of all, we are witnessing an amplification of flows of human capital within the Southern Again, I use inverted commas here, economies, especially the middle-income economies. For example, movement of human capital from Chile into Argentina, or from the Argentina into South Africa, and so forth. But also, we are witnessing a movement of human capital from the north into the emerging economies and middle-income middle economies. Ireland is at the forefront of all of this as well. We are the economy which simultaneously attracts huge numbers of human capital, and at the same time ships out of the economy huge numbers of human capital. And this is not just uh, crisis-related. Today, as I stand in front of you, we rank as the economy 12th in the world in our ability to attract key talent into the economy. Yet we rank 40th in the world in our ability to retain that capital in the economy. 
This is something crucial, and the distinction between the ability to attract and retain in the human capital is very important. But before we get into it, let's look at another example as well. An example which comes from the point of formation of human capital, the point of creation of human capital from education system. When I graduated from my alma mater, at that time, the most popular degree conferred by university at, uh, at the time was the MBA. It was the highest earning degree to have. It was the most desired and the most competed for degree as well. By the, by the early notice, the MBAs were displaced in my alma mater in this area by MFAs, Masters of Fine Arts. While the movement from MBAs to Masters of Fine Arts was the broadening of education scope, because the degree is much broader in itself. At the same time, it still retained this hierarchical, silent, bounded structure of formal education. It is still an MFA. It is still about fine arts. It's not about physics. It's not about engineering. It's not about writing codes. It is still defined. What's next, you might ask? Next for education is the creation of kaleidoscopic mosaics of knowledge skills. Knowledge and skills acting as enablement rather than the final end in itself, in terms of what defines our human capital. And in particular, the, the knowledge and skills we are looking for will be enabling, the, um, if you want, creativity and skills-based innovation. Innovation which is anchored in our narrow knowledge, and yet at the same time is broad enough to encompass new categories of knowledge as well. Entrepreneurship will come to the forefront of education system as well. You can't educate entrepreneurs, but what you can do is you can enable them. You can give them the tools to manage uncertainty, to look at the world from the point of view of any uncertainty presenting an opportunity. That is something our education system currently does not do at all. Not just in Ireland, anywhere else. Experiential risk-taking is another dimension as well. Ability to translate day-to-day -day observations and experiences into opportunities and taking the risk on those opportunities where the risk is simultaneously is managed and exploited is something, again, we don't teach people in our schools at all. This age of change, this movement to the human capital-centric economy, where human capital becomes most, uh, the most important factor of production, is a new age. And yet the process of change itself is not that new for us. We've lived through it as humanity before, not in our memory as human beings, but as collective humanity. We've had the age of land, which lasted tens of millennia, when the main productive factor in the economy, the source of all productivity growth, the source of wealth, was agricultural land and later the land of the state. That gave way to the age of bricks and mortar, the age of construction. We started building aqueducts, roads, communication systems, um, sewers, cities in modern capacity, utilities. We built, that culminated in us building trade links as well. The age of bricks and mortar, the age of construction, gave way to the age of physical technology, the machine, first powered by steam, then powered by the combustion engine, increasing complexity, but ultimately one and the same. The age of machine naturally gave way to the age of pure technology, which we inhabit today. This is disembodied technology. There is not necessarily a machine behind Google, but Google is nothing more than a technology. Does Google empower us or do we empower Google? This is a very big question because this is a differentiator between the age of tech, the age of machine, and the age that awaits us. In the age of tech and in the age of the machine, labor and, and uh, human capital was substituted for by the technology. In other words, technology was there to displace labor. Parts of human capital with very high level of skills was there to help or enable the machinery and the technology to do that task, but only parts. At the same time in that age, there was a very clear separation. And in our age today, there is still a very clear separation between the producers who hold the power of supply of goods and services and consumers who technically demand those goods and services. The two sets are completely distinct, despite the fact that consumers are also employees of the firms. This is why the firms have to go to ever lengthen and lengths in terms of trying to understand what consumers demand. We live today in the age of pure data mining, the big data, whereby we're trying to extract the signals about the large pools of consumers out of ever increasing pools of information. This is the age of the machine. This is the age of the technology. In that age, risk is concentrated in the enterprise, in each firm. The bigger the firm, the more the concentration of risk around that firm. And as a result of that, management evolved to become nothing more than risk management structure. The firm itself manages risks. 
In the future, all of that is going to go away. It will change. It will change dramatically. Technology will become enabler of human capital rather than the other way around. In addition to it, consumers will become one and the same with producers. We've already seen the cusp of that change in the 3D printing. And as consumers become one and the same with producers, the power of producer to supply, the uniqueness of producer, the vertical structure of the producer as the dominant player in supply will start dissipating as well. As that happens, what happens then? The big data doesn't matter anymore. What matters is small data, granular understanding of each individual consumer down to their level, down to our human level, away from us as the blob on the screen in terms of the data points and towards us as a human being, with our face, with our preferences, with our feelings, with our desires. What else is going to happen? All of that leads, this merger of producer and consumer is going to lead to the decentralization of the decision-making and atomization of the production processes. That means that risks are no longer concentrated in one location, but rather distributed horizontally across the different entities, both consumers and producers who are one and the same and who are nearly atomistic. What happens then? No longer there is need for risk management because risks are not concentrated. So as a result of that, what we are moving towards is the uncertainty management or mining of uncertainty to extract opportunities out of it. What else is there? Well, markers of this change are with us already. Don't have to look far. Just look at, for example, the contribution of different factors of production that exist in the economy towards economic growth. We have two sets of knowledge out of this emergence. The first set comes from the advanced economies. For the last 30 years or so, what we've been witnessing in the advanced economies is the acceleration in total factor productivity growth and human capital productivity growth, and simultaneous deacceleration or decline in the importance of physical capital and technological investment. That's right, technological investment in the age of tech is declining in the importance as the contributor to growth as well. What else we are witnessing? We are witnessing as a result of the diminishing role of physical capital, the diminishing of the role of financial capital and debt in particular. Hey, hello, we are at the biggest epicenter of the debt crisis in the world today. This is the outcome of change, of the transition from one age to another. Age of leverage is over for us in the advanced economies. At the same time, creative industries, the creative contribution to the GDP growth, the innovative factor contribution, the factor of the creativity and design arising in the importance. Interestingly enough, with a lag of about 20 or so years, exactly the same pattern is happening in the middle income and emerging markets as well. They are catching up with us. They are following exactly the same pattern of evolution as well. What are we witnessing there? We are witnessing there the flattening of the returns to capital. They are still high. It still pays to invest in physical capital in those economies. But the rate at which they are rising has slowed down, it's flattened out. Next thing is going to turn down. What else we are witnessing as well? The age of leverage is near and it's peak in those economies. Debt levels are rising, they are not yet fully exhausted, but they will be soon or later, we know that. More importantly, what we are witnessing in those economies is that the previous mode of development whereby you produce more and more of commoditized low-margin goods at higher volumes, the so-called Big China Factories model of development is disappearing as well from their geographies. They are going in the same direction we are traveling and they are getting there faster than we got there in the first place. That direction is infusing more innovation component, more design component, more indigenous creativity component into their products and services and developing new platforms for launching of their businesses. From new forms of banking to new forms of healthcare provision, the economies which we think as developing economies are now at our heels, at the top of our distribution, such as cardiac surgery, for example, in India, which is being supplied to patients in the United States and in Germany and in the United Kingdom. Or the banking services in Asia, which are displacing and removing through their technological, if you want, capability and through their ability to reach the better customers and in a better way serve them, they're displacing our own banks currently, as we speak. So the future is challenging. The future of change is always challenging. It's the main challenge to it is, of course, to the status quo. The difference in the current challenge is that unlike in the previous years, we no longer need to provide the platform of financial infrastructure and physical infrastructure for something that is coming next. Instead, we have to provide a platform of services 
and policies and institutions, which will create an overarching concept of care for human capital. Care is embodied in creation of human capital, attraction of human capital, ability of the economy to retain that human capital, and to enable it as well. This change is profound across all of the structures of the economy. I will talk just about two of them, the private sector and the public sector. But there are also very significant behavioral implications and, beha and also design implications, the way we live implications, social implications as well at food. In the private sector, the objective is for making private sector and private services in particular to become the enablers of human capital. How do we do that? That means that the firm will have to change fundamentally from being a hierarchical vertical structure whereby the management serves the ownership into the structure which actually is like a lab, horizontally distributed. It rather enables the creativity and risk taken of the employees. The ownership structure will have to change with the firm structure simply because the owners no longer will be able to control fully the entire production. Instead, they will be co-owners in the key intellectual property that is being held by them together with their employees. Intellectual pro property concept will change as well. In a rapid pace of innovation and creativity, it no longer will make any sense to patent things and copyright them. You will not have time. So the change in structure of the ownership will have to accommodate for it. Management will have to drop out from making any strategic decisions in the future. Currently, management is a strategic decision-making tool in the firm and also the enactment tool for that strategy into the production. That will have to end. It will have to end and the management will have to become nothing more than a mechanic standing on the side of Formula One racetrack waiting for the car to break down with tools at the ready. I will skip through the public sector change simply because I have run out of time, as predictably academics do. <laughs> Human capital intensive growth is upon us. It is coming. Don't take it wrong. It is time for us to change for that future, like it or not. <laughs> 